be all of you and none of me, Lord God, speaking to your people, Father God, and that the word will, Lord God, go forth and fall, Lord God, on your people's ears, Lord God, and penetrate their heart and take root, Lord God, and produce, Lord God, the righteousness that you desire for it to, to produce, Lord God. We bind up any distractions that will try to come through. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Before I get started tonight, <clears throat> I do want to say that I'm going to give out some verses that I don't have on the PowerPoint just for people to kind of read and get some some more uh, context, some more context or, on, on what I'm teaching on. Because I, I don't want to assume that everybody knows the word, but I also don't have the time to actually go through all of the stories and go through and give the, 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 the background information. So I want people to go through and read. Plus, it's just good reading as well when you are tied into the, to the, to the word. So tonight's title is Faith Without Works. My Christian brothers, what good does it do if you say you have faith but do not do things that prove you have faith? Can that kind of faith save you from the punishment of sin? What if a Christian does not have clothes or food and one of you says to him, goodbye, keep yourself warm and eat well. But if you do not give him what he needs, how does that help him? A faith that does not do things is a dead faith. So here, we're reading this scripture, I kind of feel like this, this shows why the world believes that the church is full of hypocrites. Because we come to them, well, they come to us with a problem, and let's say it's a material problem. They, like this is saying, like they're hungry, and they need, uh, uh, and they're cold, so they need a jacket and some food, and we give them the word. And then we turn around and send them on their way. <clears throat> and the person is thinking in their head, well, what about my, my needs, my physical needs? And we know that pastor always talk about, you know, meeting the need of the people before you, 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 you love them. You, you meet the need of the people, you love them. And then now you can minister to them. And so this, uh, this scripture to me is kind of talking about that. And then I also like to look at it as, these uh, how these 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 organized uh, oh, what am I trying to say? These organized uh, gangs and stuff, they go and they they they're collecting all this money from the community, but they turn around and then during the holidays they may give them a turkey on Thanksgiving. They may pass out gifts to the kids during Christmas, and so in the eyes of the people. These people are actually doing right when reality is behind the scenes they're doing more harm than they're doing good. But then you turn around and then the church is giving these people the word, which these people don't really care about the word at the time. They're going through, they're suffering. They need what they need right then and there. And so in the eyes of the, of the community, the church don't help nobody. The pastor riding around in, in a nice car and living in a big house. The elders and the deacons, they living good. But then you got the people in the community suffering. What is the church doing for them besides giving them the word? Nothing. For, to, to these people, that, that, that it's nothing. They're not going to receive what you have to say because you're not meeting the need that they have. And another thing that I, I kind of related to is the, the government passing out or giving out those stimulus checks. A lot of people was excited about the stimulus check. Face value, it did good because it was some people who actually needed those stimulus checks. So for face value, it did a lot of good. Behind the scenes, because we didn't, we don't, we don't put the 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 math together, the equation together. Behind the scenes, now we're suffering for it right now with the inflation because all that money they gave out, it didn't just come out of nowhere. They can't just create money out of nowhere. So all that money they gave out caused inflation that we're suffering from now. But people are not gonna put that stuff together. And so whoever was at, in the office at that time giving out the stimulus checks, yay, they get praised for it. Then the person that's not in office at that time, whoever's in office later on when the, when the backlash come, they get the, the blame for that. And one thing I will say that here in New Life we could be appreciative of is that we know that our leadership aren't those type of people. We, we, we for those who may not know, 
the pastor in the past, uh, there was a offering taken up for him more than once. And instead of him spending the money on himself to go get a car like he was supposed to, he was thinking about the people who needed a ride to get to church. So he went and got a church van. Then they took up another offer. He went and got another church van. And then finally, the pastor from Africa that was taking up the offerings for him had to make him promise that this time when he got the money, he would go and get himself a vehicle. And then the last thing I want to say is Jesus. When Jesus was done ministering to the people, he didn't send the people away hungry. He knew that after he gave them the word, these people had a physical need now. They needed food. And so he made sure he fed them the, the, the two fish and the five loaves. And there was other instances where he fed the people after he gave them the word. Someone may say, you have faith and I do things. Prove to me you have faith when you are doing nothing. I will prove to you I have faith by doing things. You believe there is one God that is good, but even the demons believe that, and because they do, they shake. You foolish man. You foolish man. Do I have to prove to you that faith without doing things is of no use? Was not our early father Abraham right with God by what he did? He obeyed God and put his son Isaac on the altar to die. You see his faith working by what he did, and his faith was made perfect by what he did. It happened as the holy writing said it would happen. They said, Abraham put his trust in God, and he became right with God. He was called the friend of God. A man becomes right with God by what he does and not by faith alone. So this is one of those times where, for, for those of you who don't, who don't know the story, you, uh, Genesis chapter 12, read that story about Abraham. But if Abraham, Abraham had to put some type of action behind what he believed. And so he was told to do something in Genesis chapter 12, which was, hey, God told him to get up and leave away from his family and everybody he know to a place that he was going to show him. And then he told him that, uh, when he do this, he's going to establish a covenant with him. But Abraham had to still put some work or some action behind what he was told to do, which was him actually now getting up and leaving and obeying God and doing what God told him to do. And if Abraham was to stay there after God told him this, if Abraham stayed in that place, he would have not become the father of many nations because he didn't do his part. He didn't put no type of action behind the faith or the belief in what God said. And then in Genesis chapter 22, which is also talking about Abraham, uh, God wanted Abraham to sacrifice uh, his son, his only son that he loved so much. Well, I won't say his only son, but that his son that he loved so much. And right here to me, if he had not listened to God, put action behind what God said, when God said to do it, because after God told him that he got up immediately and he went, he would have thrown the timing off of him uh, putting his son on the altar. And if that timing would have been off, that ram that was caught in the thicket may have not been in the thicket. And then that means now he would have killed his son. And so it's not just important for us to uh, put action behind uh, uh, our faith, but also timing as well. Because you don't want to be out of out of the timing that God has for you. And one of the examples I wanted to give was, <clears throat> was uh, Edison, the, the testimony he just gave about the car accident. All it probably would have taken was, and I'm not saying this was in a good way like, you know, God ordained this. I'm just saying with timing. All it, all it, all it uh, would have taken was five minutes earlier or five minutes later and that accident, would he wouldn't have hit that other person in that car. But because of the timing, they collided with each other. The same was true with Rahab, the woman who sold the use of her body. She became right with God by what she did in helping the men who had been sent to look through the country and sent them away by another road. The body is dead when there is no spirit in it. It is the same with faith. Faith is dead when nothing is done. 
So this is another one of those stories with uh, Joshua chapter 2. Uh, if you get a chance, go and read, read it about Rahab. Let me make sure I didn't. Okay, yeah. So with Rahab, uh, if you don't know the story, like I said, go back and read Joshua chapter 2. But with Rahab, she knew that the Lord had gave uh, Jericho over to the children of Israel, that they were going to they were gonna conquer Jericho. And so what she did was she helped the spies out. And when she was, uh, uh, as she was releasing them, she was letting them know, like, hey, make sure, you know, y'all remember me, look out for me and my family. And had she not done what she did, her and her family would have been killed along with everyone else in Jericho. So it, it, it wasn't just the fact that, okay, I know and I believe and I have faith that you guys, that, that God is going to deliver Jericho into your hands. Now her action had to be her helping these spies out so that now, they owe her for what she did for them. And so now we ask the question, where does your faith lie? Is it with Jesus? Is it with man? Is it with self? Is it with jobs? Is it with possessions? Or is it with Satan? Because some people actually put their faith and their trust in Satan. It may sound crazy to us, but there's a lot of people who believe that and they worship Satan as just like how we worship God. And then for some of us, our ignorance, we don't even know that that our faith lies in some of these other things, our possessions. Some of us, our faith lies in our job. Because think about it. When you have a need, the, the first thing you think about is, you know, how can I make more money? Can I work some overtime? Can I get another job? You putting your faith in the job instead of putting your faith in God. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I would not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. All right, so first off, we want to look at the first uh, part that's highlighted in red. The Lord gave instructions. So the instructions went forth first. After the instructions went forth, now, the people had to choose to believe and have faith in those instructions. After they have faith in the instructions, the next part is being obedient and doing whatever the instructions are. That's the action that goes forth to activate the faith. So just like Abraham in our story, in our history book, is documented for being obedient and receiving the promises you will, too, if you be obedient to whatever God instructed you to do. The reason why I mentioned this, and I was saying, where does your faith lie in the previous slide, is because we all know that during the pandemic, instead of putting our faith in God, we put our faith in something that was created by man. We also know that, according to the Bible, man is not perfect. Man is imperfect. Therefore, anything that comes out of man is imperfect. So you took your faith out of a perfect God and put your faith in an imperfect man. And here it is. God is telling you to promise. If you put your faith in him, he's telling you that I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then here in Deuteronomy. Now that was in Exodus. That was for the group of Israelites in Exodus. This is for the group of Israelites in Deuteronomy. Here it is. It says, if you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your ancestors. He will love you and bless you and, in and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine and olive oil, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. So once again, we see the theme of following the laws. Because he, he's, he's clearly saying, if you follow these laws, then this is the promises 
that I have for you. And it's once again another covenant being made between God and us, the, the, the people of uh, the, his chosen people. To put this, to give a good example of this, think of it as being a citizen of the United States. If you're a citizen of the United States, a law-abiding citizen, you are entitled to all the benefits and the protections of the United States. If you go to another country and they hold you as a prisoner, the United States is going to negotiate for you. They're going to do whatever it takes to get you back. If you are an illegal, or I don't even want to say illegal, if you are a citizen and you go against the laws, now you don't get those benefits. As a matter of fact, think about it. What happens to criminals? They get their benefits taken away. They get locked up and they get all their freedoms and stuff taken away from them. It's the same thing here when you look at being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. When you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you have certain benefits that are afforded to you, which we talked about a few of them already. You will be blessed more than any of the other people. None of your men or women will be childless, nor will any of your livestock be without young. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict you on the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but he will inflict them on all who hate you. The Lord will keep you free of diseases. Not nothing man created, but what the Lord said he will keep you free of diseases. And then one of the things I wanted to point out is the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt. What is he talking about? The Bible is talking about before we got saved, before we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we were now in Egypt. Because that's what Egypt represents. Egypt represents the world. E Egypt represents a carnal lifestyle. Egypt represents a life without Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So when, before, when you were in that lifestyle, you had these diseases inflicted on you. Now that you're saved, now that you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you're entitled to now not having these diseases be put on you any longer. Oh, and by the way, he says that the people who hate you, he'll put those diseases on them instead. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. What is this saying? In the unlikely event that you step out of the covering and you do get some type of disease or sickness, he's telling you that he will heal you by his stripes, the stripes that Jesus took for us during the crucifixion, through faith, which we're talking about, you will be healed. But it takes you having faith. And then it also takes you doing your part to activate the faith. Faith without works is dead. So let's look at some of the benefits of being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And I put a few this is just a few things a few things but these were pulled from mark chapter 16 verse 17 through 18 read it to reference it but some of the benefits of of citizenship in the kingdom is driving out demons speak with new speak with new tongues pick up snakes with your hands drink deadly poison and not be harmed and heal the sick and these are just a few of the benefits of being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So once again, just going back to a pandemic-like situation, why would we turn away from a God that's given us all these benefits? That's like going, that's like being here in the United States, being a citizen of the United States, and turning down all these benefits to go over to one of these, these uh, war-ridden countries, or go over into a communist country, or go into a socialist country. That's like going over to China. Now you turned over all this freedom and all these benefits and all these protection and all these rights to go over to China to be oppressed. And I don't know if anybody actually know. I actually learned this within the last couple of weeks. This is just some random information. This don't even have nothing to do with the word. But over in China, the people work six days a week. And if I'm not mistaken, it's 10 or 12 hour shifts. And they don't get paid like we get paid. That's just something I want y'all to think about. 
Oh, well, my. So what is faith? The Bible tells us that now faith is being sure we will get what we hope for. It is being sure of what we cannot see. Both of these are not tangible. You can't put your hands on them. It's not something that you can, with your five senses experience, you can't taste it, you can't feel it, you can't touch it, you can't see it, you can't hear it. So therefore now, faith is something else. It's not something that, that I, I don't even want to say that, that exists because it exists, but you have to believe that it exists before it actually materializes itself here in the natural. So anything that you could experience with your five senses doesn't require faith because you already know it. I don't need faith to know that this is here. It's here. Through faith, we understand that the world was made by the word of God. Things we see were made from what could not be seen. Once again, God's words were not visible. When none of this existed and he spoke, you couldn't see his words coming out of his mouth. But you see the evidence of it now. Everything was created by his words, which were not visible, which for us requires faith. So let's give a few examples of faith at work. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt it in her body that she was free from her suffering. Her faith was the thought that if I can get up on Jesus and touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now, the work or the action was her taking the risk, coming out in public to go press through this crowd to get to Jesus for that healing. And for those of you who don't know, in those times, when a woman's cycle was on, she was supposed to be unclean during that time period. She was a not, not supposed to be out in public at all. And anything she touched became unclean as well. So now this woman was risking her life for the faith in that if I touch this man's clothes, I'm going to be healed. If she didn't put no action behind just that faith, she wouldn't have been healed at that moment. And the only reason I say at that moment, because maybe later on the disciples would have healed her or something. But at that very moment, she would have missed out on it. Because she had to put some action behind what she believed. Then the woman knowing that what had happened, and we, we skipping down a few verses. Then the woman knowing what had happened to her came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And this is just Jesus pretty much confirming that because of her faith and which was the driving force behind her action is why she's made whole now. Here goes another example. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that he re re revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Before we go on, the reason I highlighted what I highlighted is because a lot of us are asking God or asking the pastor or asking the elders or asking the deacons, hey, I need help. And you know what God will do a lot of times is he'll ask you, well, what do you already have? What's, what, what's already in your possession? Because then he, he's going to take what you already have and use that as the solution to your problem. In Exodus chapter 4, which is another one of those readings that you, you should read for, for context, Moses was standing there and God asked him, what's in your hand? Moses had a staff in his hand. 
that staff, if you read that the, the whole entire time that Moses was leading the people, uh, 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 the Israelites out of Egypt to the promised land, that staff was doing all the miracles and all the work. That same staff that was in his hand the whole time was the same staff that parted the Red Sea and allowed them to walk on dry ground across the Red Sea to cross uh, and get away from their enemies. What was in his hand? The staff. That's what God used. What was in her possession? The small jar of olive oil. So as we go on, Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. So she had faith in the man of God. Because the man of God, she went to the man of God asking, hey, what should I do? I need help. So she, she had faith. Now the man of God, once again, like we've seen in, uh, uh, before, the man of God gives instructions, which requires her now to do something in order to activate the faith. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. She had to put action behind the faith in the man of God's instructions. The man of God told her, go get a bunch of jars and borrow as many as you can from all your neighbors. She went and did it. Then he told her, Pour into each jar until they're full. She poured into each jar until it was full. When she got to the last jar, there was no more oil coming out of the, 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 the little vessel that she was pouring out of. Now, she could have, and this is and this is sometime where, you know, God gives us some instructions. And if we actually think, if she really thought about it, let's say if she would have had enough jars to fill up the state of Texas. That little bit of oil that she had would have kept pouring until every single last jar was filled. But it took her acting on the faith of what the man of God spoke to her. This is another uh, example. This is to um, Jesus. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Once again, same thing. Instructions go forth. Jesus telling them, hey, Jesus had just finished ministering to the people and using their, uh, their boat. And then he came back and said, hey, y'all go out here and y'all cast y'all nets. Now, Peter, or well, Simon, his name Simon at the time, was, this was his profession. This man knew his craft. They know the best time to fish is, is, is during the night. Now here it is during the day, Jesus telling them, go back out there and cast your nets. And he telling them, man, look, we've been out there all night. But what he didn't do was be disobedient. He clearly said, because you say so, I will go back out there and let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. His obedience led to abundance, not just for him, but for those around him as well. Because he had to go and call other people boats to come help him bring the, the, the catch in, it was so large. It was so large that the boats started sinking because it, it, was, it was filled with so much fish. It was so heavy. Many of us have been leaning on our own understanding. Simon was a professional fisher. Jesus was a professional carpenter. Why is a carpenter telling a fisherman how to fish? But the fisherman listened to the carpenter, and in return, he received an abundance on his catch. Many of us are doing the same thing in life. Instead of listening to God, we're, seeking, we're, we're, we're leaning on our own understanding. So because we're trying, to, we're trying to figure things out on our own, 
and we're trying to do it where it makes sense. And sometimes when, when God does things, it doesn't make sense to us. This is a scripture that uh, I, I think is worth reading. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, especially for those people who are lacking in their finances. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So, what does this look like for us? All my bills are behind. I'm behind. My, my car about to get repossessed. I'm about to be kicked out of my home. The lights are off. The water is off. So I already don't have enough money to make it as it is. And I need to feed my children who, by the way, are hungry right now. So you telling me, take what I have and sow tithes when I already don't have enough. See, that now is us trying to lean on our own understanding instead of trusting in God with all our heart. And he's telling you in his word, he's saying, it's just like he's saying, Test me. Test me. Try it. Try it out. Test me and see that I won't do it. It's just like a person that you know. <laughs> it's like a person that you know for a fact that if y'all get in a fight, you're going to win. You wish and you hope they put hit me. I want you to hit me. I, I dare you to hit me and see what's going to happen. God's saying the same thing. Just do it. And see, I'm telling you, if you just try it, just please give me one time, just try it one time and see that I won't open up the floodgates of heaven and y'all won't be like Simon and the rest of these fishermen. It's Y'all going to be having trouble trying to get the fish back in. You're going to be having trouble trying to figure out where to put all this money that, that, that God just blessed you with. Trying to help somebody with their finances. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he, had, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Simon was ashamed because... He realized the presence of who he was standing in front of, and, he's, and, 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 and he knew that his life was full of sin. So he felt like, man, I'm not even worthy of being in your presence. Jesus turns around, and instead of condemning him, he hired him. He took a man who was a professional fisher, who spent his whole life perfecting his craft, as a fisherman and told him, now I want you to use that same thing that you've taken your whole life perfecting, all them techniques that you learned and everything, and I want you to come use it for me and my kingdom. Instead of going out here and catching these fish, I want you to be a fisher of men. I want you to go out here just the way you caught that, that, that you, you obeyed what I told you to do, and y'all brought in this large catch, I'm, you're going to do the same thing for my kingdom. You're going to bring in a large catch of people. And that's exactly what he ended up doing. So for many of us, what is your profession in? What is it that you've spent your, what is it that you went to school to study for? What is it that you've spent your life perfecting? Because God want to take that and use that for his kingdom. Are you enforcing the laws of this world? God wants you to turn around and he want to hire you to enforce his laws of his word. Are you out here practicing medicine to help heal people? God wants you to take that same type of fighting mentality to heal people, and now he wants you to use his power to heal people. Are you, financial, like, are you full of financial knowledge? God wants to use you. Are you. Maybe you're a banker or somebody. God wants to use that knowledge that you have to teach his people how to be good stewards of their money so that now he can trust them with more. Like, think about all of these different things. You got mechanics out here, right? And then now they get saved. What's in your hand, mechanic? Oh, I got a wrench. I want you to use that wrench, and I want you to bless these people over here because they can't afford to get their car fixed, and that's the only means to get back and forth to work. They're struggling as it is.
When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his... No, no, no. There we go. So by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Because of Enoch's faith, he pleased God. And then here it is, the Bible is telling us if you don't have faith, it's impossible for you to please God. And so this is one of those readings, Hebrew chapter 11, when you get a chance, read it all because it's, it's talking about faith and the different people and how they, how, how, how they used their faith and the action they had to put behind their faith. So why is it, why is it impossible without faith to please God? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the only way to get to the Father, the only way to get to eternal life is through Jesus Christ. Not my words. That's what he said. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Why is it important and why is it impossible without faith to please God? So for both of these scriptures, did any of you walk with Jesus? Did you, did you see him? Did you touch him? Can you smell him? Once again, you can't experience Jesus with your five senses. So therefore, the only way to receive him is through faith. He's offering, it says, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He is offering a gift that nobody or no one could ever give you, which is eternal life. And the only way to receive that gift is through faith. And so now think of it like this. You love somebody, somebody that's real close to you, whoever you can think of that you love the most. You come up and you get them the most precious gift that you can think of to give to this person. And all they have to do is either qualify for the gift or accept the gift. And they don't do neither one of them. That wouldn't hurt you that you went out of your way to get this precious gift for this person you love so much and they either reject the gift or they don't do what's necessary to receive the gift. That's the, the correct wording. And that's the same thing that happens when you don't have faith. How can you receive the gift of eternal life if you don't have the faith to believe in what Jesus did? But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. This is the reason right here. It's impossible to please God without faith. Because you need faith in order to receive this. So you have to believe. First, you have to you have to believe in your heart, right? But you also have to do it. You have to your action has to go behind your faith, which is now you opening your mouth and declaring with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It, it requires something on your part to do. You have to now believe in your heart, someone in someone that you've never met, never saw never touched, 
never ex experienced because coming out of the world and coming into Christ, you never experienced Jesus before at all. And so now this is why it's impossible without faith to please God because the only way God will be pleased is when you're reconciled back to him and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Un until that point, you're not a part of the body. And, th and, 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 and I, I wish I would have had the, the, the scripture in here that talks about uh, those people, pretty much those people who go to hell was never a part of the body. They was never a part of, uh, of the family of God. Right now, any person that's living a life without Jesus in their life, their father is Satan. That is their father. Regardless of how you look at it, there's no neutral. God said either you're hot or cold because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. So you're going you, you gonna to be on uh, one or the other, one, one side or the other. There's no neutral. There's no gray. And so, therefore, anybody who does not have Jesus as their Lord and Savior, their name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, their, their father is Satan. If your father is Satan, you're going to get the inheritance of what your father has. Satan's inheritance is going to the lake of fire, eternal damnation for all of eternity. So you're either going to choose that father or you're going to choose the father who's going to put you in paradise and show you love and only thinks goodness towards you and only wants the best for you. And so, it takes faith. And this right here is the most important part of any believer's life, is accepting Jesus into their, into their life. There's going to be people that stand before God on judgment day, and he's going to say, depart from me, for I know you not, you worker of iniquity. Those people thought that they were doing works. In God's name, they probably was calling Jesus' name out. Jesus' name is powerful, so it's going to do what it do. But they probably never did this part and accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They, they probably never de declared with their mouth that Jesus was Lord and believed in their heart that God raised them from the dead. And so I don't want that to be any of us in here. And the reason why I'm talking about faith right now, before I close out, uh, uh, the reason why I'm talking about faith right now is because the, the times that we are in, biblically, in the last days, when you look at the prophecies, you got to have some real serious faith. We got it easy over here in Western society for right now. Because God's word is going to come to pass, and it says there will be a time that you're going to have to make a decision. You're either going to denounce Jesus as your Lord and Savior or you're going to be beheaded. And I done talked to y'all more, more than once before about y'all thinking that it's going to be this clean cut guillotine chopping your head off. They're not using that over there right now in these third world countries. Whatever means necessary to get your head off. It could be a quick death. It could be a slow death. Are you ready for it? Right now, where our faith is here in Western society, we're nowhere near ready for it. We can't, we can't trust our God to heal us from some of the, the simple sicknesses and the simple diseases that we have. And then we're going to turn around. And a lot of us, we, 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 like to, we like to say cliche things. For God I live and for God I die. Peter said the same thing. And then when the time came, he denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And this was somebody who walked with Jesus Christ, who saw the power of Jesus Christ in person and experienced it. He was the one. Did any of you walk on water? He did. And then when that time came, he denied him. Are you ready to, are, are you ready to die for Jesus no matter what that looked like? Thank God Peter had a second chance. And the second time he went ahead and he was crucified. That's a lot of suffering. Are you willing to suffer? Your, your, it may not be a quick death for you. It may be suffering. 
Paul counted it all joy, all of the trials and tribulations he was going through, all of the suffering he was going through for, 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 for Jesus' name. He counted it all joy. Are you ready to count it all joy? If somebody take you and dip you in boiling oil and you survive, are you ready to count it all joy? This is the type of stuff they was doing to the believers back then, feeding them the hungry lions. It's not no quick death. They was torturing these people. Look at what, look at what King Nebuchadnezzar was about to do to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Throw them in a furnace to burn them alive. Thank God, regardless where their faith was, they didn't care. They told him, hey, we know that God can deliver us from out of your hands. And even if he doesn't, it doesn't mean he wasn't capable of doing it. But regardless if he does or if he doesn't, we still not going to bow down and worship your idol. Are you willing to say that? Where is your faith? Where does your faith lie? We don't know if, and I, and, and, and I don't, the way I feel, this next presidential election, if you, I know it's a lot of people who don't want to vote. I'd rather you vote and make the wrong decision than to not vote at all. Ask the Holy Spirit who you should be voting for because I'm not saying either one is good. I'm just saying pick the better of both evils. One is going to expedite Satan's agenda, and it's all about Satan's agenda. How are you going into somebody else's country and trying to get them to change their laws so that they, they have same-sex marriage? What are you doing? Mind your business and stay over here in the United States. We got enough problems here, and you over there worried about these people in their country. Y'all need to pray because that person gets in office. Your freedoms might be taken away a lot quicker than what you think. And as a matter of fact, I was just talking to somebody. I didn't know this. I know that there's a lot of people like Bill Gates and all, a lot of these extremely wealthy people they believe that the world is overpopulated, and in order for the future of mankind to continue, we need to depopulate the world, which means get rid of a bunch of people. And as a matter of fact, I remember why I cannot find it. I remember watching the video. Was it Bill? I think it was Bill Gates. He was talking about the different ways of population control. And, and, and one of the things he was going through he was going through trying to say that it's not, it's not enough natural resources for the way we're rapidly increasing in the pop population of this earth. So he was saying there's different ways of how you can control that. You can either increase more or, 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 or increase the natural resources, which you can't, or you could get rid of the people using the natural resources so that they last longer. So if you can't control one, obviously you can control the other. And there's certain people that get into these political positions, they're fully on board. And one person in particular, you do your own research, said that in, 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 in so many words, this world is overpopulated. And in order for the future of our children, we need to do something about it. Same person talking about defunding the police. Same person talking about same-sex marriage. All these, by the way, all this stuff, when you, when you sit back and think about it and you look at it, it looks like it's pushing things further toward what Satan wants. One world order, one religion. Y'all pray about this election. If you, ain't, if you don't plan on voting, just go out there and, and Christmas tree it. Maybe the Holy Spirit may make you pick the right ones. Just, just don't leave it blank. Don't leave it blank for somebody else to come in and use your ballot because it was all type of crazy. Something else I learned. In certain states, it's not required to have an ID to vote. There's nothing that stops you from getting in the line, voting, going to the back of the line, going back through, voting again, going to the back of the line, going back through, voting again, 
Just some stuff that y'all need to start thinking about and considering. And so on that note, I'm going to close this out in prayer. Lord God, I thank you, Father God, for your word. I, I, I pray, Lord God, that this is opening the eyes of your people, Lord God, getting different thoughts inside their minds that they will question certain policies, certain laws, certain rules, that they will even question, Lord God, the way they think, Lord God, and how they think about your word, Father, and the lack of, Lord God, faith in you, Lord God, and the things that you promised us, Lord God. Lord God, we don't we don't want to put our faith, Lord God, in imperfect man, Lord God. We don't want to put our faith, Lord God, in the creation of man, Lord God. But we want to put our faith in you, Lord God. Help us, Father God, to abandon, Lord God, the ways of this world, Lord God. Because, Lord God, we have definitely been conformed to the ways of this world, Lord God. We need to be delivered, Lord God, and set free, Lord God, so that we can, Lord God, operate, Lord God, as your people, Lord God. Lord God, you're the same God who rain manna from heaven to feed your people out in the desert, Lord God. The same God who had water come out of a rock so that they would no longer be thirsty, Lord God. The same God that the clothes they wore from the time they was little to the time they grew old grew on their bodies, Lord God. The same God who delivered them into the land flowing with milk and honey and delivered their enemies into their, their hands, Lord God. You're the same God today, Lord God, that you were back then, Lord God. But we're not experiencing you because we, Lord God, are hindering you, Lord God. We're putting you in a box, Lord God. So help us, Lord God, to stop hindering your power, Lord God, from working in our life, Lord God. And Lord God, us hindering, Lord God, somebody else's salvation or freedom, Lord God, because we're afraid, Lord God, to allow you to work through us, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord God, that we would no longer, Lord God, be bound to, Lord God, Satan in this system, Lord God. But we would, Lord God... Take on the full benefits of the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, at this time, if you can get your tithes and all.